Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here. I want to talk about medications for adrenal health, you know, whether or not you need them and what kinds are out there and whether they help or not. So for starters, I want to talk about this adrenal fatigue concept very briefly. I won't go too deep into this, but it will become more and more important. Uh, I, I like the term in the sense that everyone thinks about this under that term. I don't like the term in that it implies something that's not real meaning that it implies that the adrenal glands are fatigued. Well, in the case of what we call adrenal fatigue, they're not fatigued. <laughs> it's not that the body cannot produce cortisol. It's that the body doesn't want to or has intentionally adjusted cortisol in some way. But it's not the fault of the adrenals. It's not that they're unable to make something the body needs. So there was a case study that one of my doctors told me about recently. He had a gentleman come in to see him who had had very low adrenal function. He was crashed. And a doctor had put him on hydrocortisone, as many often can. Uh, so he was on this for several months. And at first, he had a lot more energy from that. But then he started putting on just a ton of weight. He actually gained close to 30 pounds in, the, in those few months. <clears throat> and significant fluid retention. His blood sugar was getting unstable, you know, heading towards diabetes. So he tried to stop this stuff. But when he did, Whenever he would try to stop it or lower the dose, his energy just plummeted way worse than it was even before he started. So he was stuck on this stuff where he couldn't really stop it and it was causing this weight gain and these side effects and he was totally in a bind. And that's, that's how he came in. So Dr. Rezai was able to work on the health of his adrenals and really, it's really about this HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's the health of that whole unit that matters. He was able to help him get that unit healthier, but then also have a compounded medication, which did have cortisol, but in very small, measurable amounts. And it also had some good botanical medications as well. And we used that, he used that as a stepping stone to guide him off of the cortisol and not to need it, and to get healthy again. So that's a quick synopsis. Then let me talk about, for starters, which medications are proposed. What are the categories that are commonly used? The biggest category we call glucocorticoids, and that means steroids that control glucose metabolism. Because cortisol itself, it's, it's affecting blood sugar, it's affecting glucose metabolism. So we've got naturals and we've got synthetics. So naturals would include cortisol, which is compounded, that's not made in a common existing pre-made medication, and then cortisone, which is the same as hydrocortisone, then there are adrenal glandular supplements. Uh, they actually do have active hormones in them. And the drawback about those is that the amounts they have is not really measured or calibrated or controlled. You don't know how much you'll get and it won't be consistent. So there's that. And in terms of being complete, there's also injectable adrenal glandulars. There's a thing called ACE or adrenal cortical extract. And that was used for a, some time back as an injection before there were versions of uh, prednisone to be used in emergency room type situations. So I've seen that particular injection used. I'm not a fan of it because it's something that's hard to produce in a safe fashion. Some people have had dangerous reactions to it that I've, that I've witnessed when it's been used in, in other clinics. Uh, and another thing that does exist would be glycerizin, which is an extract from licorice. That's been used in the form of just crude licorice root or as various concentrates. Also, there is an injection made from that. Now, to be really precise, this is actually not a glucocorticoid, licorice is not, but there's an enzyme called 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, or 11-beta-HSD, and what that does is it slows down the body from weakening cortisol by making it into cortisone. So by not, not turning off your cortisol, you keep more of it in play for longer. So licorice is kind of like a glucocorticoid. Not quite, but kind of. We'll talk about that distinction. Then we've got a lot of synthetic glucocorticoids. And there's many, uh, dexamethasone, prednisone, canalog, prednisinolone, betamethasone, lot, lots of them. And they're not all the same potency. Some are stronger than others, even at different milligram amounts. So uh, there's a chart I put in the article that, that differentiates that. The next category we have would be mineralocorticoids. 
Now, the adrenals do a lot. <laughs> they're regulating your blood sugar, but they're also regulating your blood electrolytes and minerals. And that's especially of the function of the mineralocorticoids. So fluticortisone is the main one that the body makes, also called aldosterone. And then Florinaf is a medication that's an analog of that. <clears throat> there, are, there are some that do have adrenal compromise that have very low blood pressure and they cannot retain sodium. Their blood sodium stays far too low. And in some cases, Florinaf can be a helpful, pretty safe way of, of regulating that. The drawback is that if someone doesn't need it, they can overabsorb and retain sodium and have higher blood pressure. Bad thing. But for some, it's actually a helpful fit to keep them from feeling faint and dizzy when they get up. Or Also, oddly enough, there's been data saying that it can offset some of the anxiety of speaking. You know, it's a tough thing just being in front of a crowd, but part of it is also standing for long periods of time. So you've got some stress in your standing, and your blood pressure dropping can be part of what makes it just hard to concentrate. So quirky thing about Florinaf. Then there's also the steroids that the adrenal glands make. And the big ones there are DHEA and pregnenolone. So who's got to replace glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and steroids? Well, those that, that cannot make them, those to where the glands cannot produce them. And who is that? Well, the big category is those that have ongoing Addison's disease. So think of Addison's disease as a Hashimoto's of the adrenals. It's a situation to where the immune system has attacked the adrenals and made it to where they're just, they're damaged. They don't have enough building blocks to make these hormones adequately any longer. And that leads to an overt deficiency. There are also some medications that can really suppress the adrenals. You know, in those cases, it's rarely a matter of needing long-term glucocorticoid replacement. It's more a matter of just getting off the medications. But these are primarily antifungals and a few other odds and ends. And there's some rare diseases like amyloidosis or hemochromatosis or blood loss, you know, some metastatic diseases, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis. These are cases that can also compromise the function of the adrenals. So what about adrenal fatigue? What about not a disease, not Addison's, but low cortisol and then crash stage? Uh, in this case, the big distinction is that cortisol can be low because the body is trying to lower cortisol. So it's not the same as it's low because the body can't make cortisol. And think about it this way. If your car is just sputtering and you know, run down, not functioning well, you're going to carefully drive it to the garage. You're not going to race to the garage because you might not make it. And that's what your body, your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, is doing in concert when you're run down or compromised in some way. It may lower cortisol output. So cortisol can be the source of the fatigue, the low cortisol. And giving cortisol can reverse that fatigue. But the problem is your body wants it. <laughs> so the solution is to really see why does the body want that? You know, what are the factors that have gone on and accumulated that have made it to where you've gotten to a compromised state? And then to reverse those. We've got to give the body some respect and realize there's wisdom behind the strategy. So how do you know if cortisol is low by intent or by disease state. The simplest thing is to measure ACTH. This is a common blood level. Any doctor can order this. Uh, there's more examples too now to where people can order their own blood tests. You know, any lab now or Life Extension Foundation. And simple scenario is that ACTH should be somewhat opposite cortisol when, when we're seeing these things off. So if cortisol is low and ACTH is high, then what's happening there is the body is asking for cortisol, but the adrenals cannot make it. On the other hand, if cortisol is low and ACTH is normal or low, then that's saying the body is intentionally calming down the adrenals. So the opposite scenario is also true. If cortisol is very high and ACTH is low, that's a disease. There's a problem. There's cortisol coming out, but your body doesn't want cortisol to come out, and there's something wrong with the adrenals. Or there's some other tissue that's acting like your adrenals. That's pheochromocytoma, and that's rare, but it happens. But more commonly than not, when cortisol is high, ACTH is high. And that's saying that the body's trying to do it. So when they go together, it's on purpose. When they're way opposite, something is off. <laughs> uh, and in the cases of what we call adrenal fatigue, 
ACTH is not going to be elevated. It'll be normal or even low, and that's the big difference. Another big one is that, kind of like Hashimoto's, you know, with, with Addison's, you can see measurable adrenal antibodies. And they also confirm that the, uh, the body is attacking the gland, and that's, that's the reason for that. Now, there have been studies about people that have chronic fatigue taking glucocorticoids, taking cortisol medications. Well, I guess there's been a study that I've seen. There's possibly been more, but one that I have seen. And it can help in the short term. And I see that clinically. For sure, you could take it and feel better. Uh, stimulants can make you feel better in other ways, too. So uh, cocaine or mega doses of caffeine or crystal meth, you know, you'll get energy from that. But you push your health in the wrong direction. And the study that was published about corticoids, glucocorticoids for chronic fatigue, they were only looking at very short time frames, like one month roughly. But I've seen this clinically when someone doesn't need cortisol or hydrocortisone and they're put on it, even if it helps them in the short term, it does cause long-term risks and harm. And these are big things. So I mentioned about the case about gaining weight, becoming diabetic, also bone thinning, you know, compromised immune system, skin damage, insomnia, uh, chronic pain can show up. We can see nerve damage and numbness or tingling from that. Muscle thinning, muscle wasting, abdominal pain, digestive issues. There's also data saying that heart disease risks can be higher. Um, certain cancer risks can be higher. Fluid retention, facial hair growth, head hair thinning, acne, difficulty concentrating, dizziness, all sorts of negative changes. And then the other problem is that these can create dependency issues. So you, you don't need them, you're not feeling well for them, but you can't safely stop them. So if you are crashed and you've got low cortisol, what else can you do? Well, you can heal it. That's the cool thing. When it's not a progressive disease, it is reversible. And I rarely see it take more than three months to see someone all the way better or darn close to all the way better. You know, think about the strategies of carb cycling, the low, low carb breakfast, healthy carb dinner. Some of the good adaptogens can help. Extra, extra rest is huge. Uh, the adrenal reset diet, dig deep in the whole crash chapter. That's what that's all about is reversing it. And myself, my doctors, we've seen this just countless, countless times. So let's say you were on adrenal medications and you did not need them. So how can you come off? For one step is you've got to treat the real causes. You've got to take care of your adrenals and help get them better so you have less dependence because you're making it more effectively by yourself. But then also it takes medical guidance and it takes gradual, gradual taper. I like compounded versions of cortisol to where it's liquid and you can have like a milligram per drop or a milligram per three drops. The nice thing about that is you can just go baby steps really slow and very consistently. Uh, think about roughly a few milligrams per week as far as a time frame. So if someone's been on less than five milligrams, it might take them about a month. If they've been on close to 10 milligrams, it might be a couple months. And when they're on higher doses, it can be longer because now we're thinking about what you're taking as being a larger percent of what your body would have made. So there's more suppression. If you make cortisol, like say you make 25 milligrams a day, and you're taking pills that equal 25 milligrams a day, now you're not making much at all by yourself. So it takes longer to bounce back from that. So that can be a few months, but it is possible for people. So it is, it is possible when you're also healing the adrenals with the good diet and the good adaptogens, light therapies, healthy lifestyle therapies, so it's completely possible. And we've seen this very frequently. So take, take great care of yourself, you know, take a check and see where your adrenals are currently. You know, take a look at the adrenal quiz and they're not in great shape. I would argue that unless you've got Addison's or another medical problem, cortisol medications, glucocorticoids, they're not the solution. They can help in the short term, but I want you helped in the long term. That's the big goal. Dr. Christensen here with you and we'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.